Good morning. Welcome to worship on a cold winter morning. I wonder if maybe we want to turn the fans off. Um, that might be a good thing. You're hot up here. It's a little chilly down here, so you won't be up there that long. <laughs> um, so welcome to worship. It's always good to be together and to welcome you into this space on a bright, sunny morning um, and to gather. I have just a couple announcements as we gather this morning. It is, of course, um, the week for the fiscal meeting. So following worship today, we'll have our fiscal meeting. Um, there are some extra copies, printed copies of the fiscal report around the corner if you need one or forgot yours. Um, and I'll, I think what we usually do is, you know, you're certainly welcome to stay, but voting members are encouraged to sit closer to the front. Um, and if you're just curious and you're a visitor or you're not quite yet a member, you're welcome to stay, but sit maybe towards the back so we get a more clear sense of a quorum, which is always important and a challenge for our business meetings together. Well, for reads, we'll gather this Tuesday and we'll take on our February book, which is Ta-Nehisi Coates's book, The Water Dancer. It's a relatively new book. We don't often choose a book that's that new um, in hardcover, but um, he is an author that we have read before, and um, there's a little bit of buzz about this book, and so we'll gather on Tuesday afternoon at 4 o'clock in the gathering space to begin our conversations about that. Um, are there other announcements to share with one another for the good of the congregation? All right, then let us be in a spirit of worship as we uh, together listen to the bells who are on high this morning um, in the loft in a, for our prelude.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Show us your ways, O Lord. Lead us in your truth and teach us. Open our eyes, minds, and hearts to know your will and to follow it. Reveal your vision for us and keep us focused and faithful to what you would have us do. Bring us together to worship and work for your purpose and move us forward into your future. Amen. Our opening hymn is in the red hymnal, 489, I Would Be True. Please join me for the unison prayer of invocation and the Lord's Prayer. God, the Holy Spirit, you are the restless breath of love that sweeps through the world. You move where you will, breaking down barriers, stirring hearts to change, making all things possible. Inspire each one of us to hunger and thirst for justice. Come, Spirit of God, sweep through our world, bringing great change. May the bounty of your goodness be shared more justly, so all may share in the rich blissings of your creation. And for us, bring transformation in our praying and living, so that we may act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you all the days of our lives. As we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A great new haircut. Hi, how are you? I'm not sure my mic is on, hold on. My mic is on. Um, so I started watching a new show on Netflix called Tiny House Nation. Have you seen it? Do you have any thought about like what Tiny House Nation could be about? It's probably about amazing tiny little 
amazing tiny little houses. That's sort of true. I mean, they end up being amazing at the end of each episode, but actually every episode starts with an unfinished tiny little house and a family that has had some unexpected thing happen that means they haven't finished their tiny house and so they're not ready, but they're desperate to move in. So like the first episode I watched was about this couple who was getting married in four weeks, moving in six weeks from Atlanta, Georgia to Maine, and um, was already like, oh, oh, and the husband was gonna start a new job in five weeks. And the house wasn't finished. Bad, not good. So the, so the show comes in and they, they make this house. And of course, part of each episode is trying to work with this family to say, you're living in this apartment or this condo or this house and you're moving into a tiny house. So the tiny house, right? Have you ever seen a tiny house? Oh yeah. How big are they? You have to be able to tow them on the back of a car. So they're like the size of a trailer, right? So they're like 300 to 400 square feet of living space. And most people that move into a tiny house are coming out of a living space of like 800 or 1,000 feet. So they ha are going to have half as much living room. So there's always this, do you really need all of this stuff? How are you going to live in this tiny house if you have all of this stuff? So in the Gospel of Mark today, we get that passage where Jesus um, says to his disciples right before they take off for a trip, bring your cloak, bring your sandals, but don't bring too much stuff because we're going to be moving a lot, right? I was like, oh, it's like a tiny house. It's like ministry in a tiny house, right? So, which also had me thinking, like, how easy it is. Do you pack your own suitcase when you travel? Do you generally bring not enough stuff when you pack your suitcase or too much stuff? Maybe, Maybe I feel like we all bring too much stuff, right? So this is this scripture reading today is really Jesus' way of saying we all bring too much stuff. Right? Travel lightly. We need less stuff than we think we do. So this tiny house experience, I don't know that I could live in a tiny house, but it's an interesting idea to think about what could I let go of? What are the things in our lives that we don't really need? Like we don't need to pack the toaster when we pack a suitcase, right? Yeah. Although I sometimes bring some version of a coffee pot with me. <laughs> All right, so well, let's have a prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for the scriptures that teach us and remind us to travel light, to touch the earth lightly, to go at whatever adventure is before us with an open heart and a gentle spirit to find our traveling companions and to take less than we think we need. For we are in this for the heavy work of justice and love, compassion and kindness, and we really need less earthly stuff than we think we do to get there. We pray in your name this day and always. Amen. Gospel reading from the Gospel of Mark today. We are in the sixth chapter of Mark. You're going to hear verses 1 to 29. So this is, in many ways, a good storytelling moment for the Gospel of Mark. Mark is a beautiful writer and a concise writer in many ways if you compare Mark's Gospel to the other Gospels. Though in part the story that I will read you today is a horror story. It's a story within a story, and we get this gentle part um, in this inspiring part in the first part of the story, and then just as the disciples and Jesus leave the scene, we get the second part of the story, the story within the story, um, which is of course the story of the beheading of John the Baptist. So this beheading story of John the Baptist is meant to remind you of the story of Esther. Um, do you remember the story of Esther? Esther, who in the Old Testament um, is this beautiful queen who is just um, and remarkable for her beauty. She was the Jewish queen of a Persian emperor. She protected her faith. She protected her cousin Mordecai and her people. But Mark reverses Esther's story um, of sexual attraction for ulterior purposes. So we should find Mark's tale unsettling and troubling. Um, Esther entices the emperor to reverse the threat upon them and to do good and well by her people. Um, and the story of the beheading of John the Baptist is the opposite of that. So from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. 
Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They said, where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? They took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, in, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. And some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work within him. Others said, it is Elijah. And others yet said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, who bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to take your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his couriers and quarters and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter, Herodias, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. He solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give to you. Even half my kingdom, she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? And her mother replied, the head of John the baptizer. So immediately the daughter rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison. He brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard about it, they came and took the body and laid it in a tomb. Here ends our reading. May God indeed add blessing to the reading of this word. To join me in the spirit of prayer. Holy and gracious God, we sometimes overlook the horror stories in our scriptures. They trouble and unsettle us, and it can be hard for us to find a word of good news and hope in their midst. Open our hearts this day and our minds. Trouble us in the places that need awakening. Encourage us and grow us into better disciples 
that the words of my heart and the meditation on my lips might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, my Savior and Redeemer. Amen. My friends, it's been a week of dancing women. Did you see the Super Bowl halftime show? Have you followed any of the controversy and the critique of the two women that dominated the halftime show, the Shakira and the J-Lo, the absolutely out of control critique that's been happening on social media feeds across the, the way? Everything from uh, the dance steps to these two women's ages to their costumes or lack thereof. It's been a week of dancing women. And this horror story has its own dancing woman in it. In the midst, it also, ironically, is the week that Taylor Swift's new documentary got dropped on Netflix, and so I've been hearing about yet another dancing woman and her own arrested development um, at an emotional age that um, many have critiqued her for the decisions of her life and her emotional immaturity in, um, in her dating and in her family life. It's been a week of dancing women. This horror story from Mark should trouble us. The women receive all blame. The men are excused. Herod, while sympathetic to John, cannot stand up to his daughter's preposterous asks, to his wife's real preposterous ask, and his wife, Herodias, is unforgiving. This daughter receives an unlimited choice of options for a gift without consequence. She not only selects cold-bloodedly John's head, but she puts her own spin on it. She says, and I would like it on a platter. Salome, who is not named in this passage, but through the texts of antiquity, we have come to learn that Herodias' daughter was probably not also Herodias, but Salome. The story is part of the reason, my friends, that Jehovah Witnesses do not celebrate birthdays. Did you know that our Jehovah Witness um, brothers and sisters don't celebrate birthdays? They pin their reasoning for that on this horrific story and on a story out of Genesis chapter 40 with an unnamed pharaoh. Horrible things happen at birthday parties. We will not celebrate birthdays. Josephus suggests in his Antiquities of the Jews that John the Baptist actually is executed because he might inspire a rebellion. So even in the time of Mark's gospel, it was not okay to really talk about the politics of the day and what the real threat was that was happening. Clearly, we are supposed to focus on the fact that John was righteous and Herod was not. But let's do it at the expense of the dancing women. Prophetic voices and preaching and action. Prophetic voices always have a cost to them. A cost, and yet... Prophetic voices are entirely and remain entirely necessary. Truth needs a voice. The truth will come out eventually. The story of John shows us that even in the face of silencing John's story and John's message, the story continues and carries on that long after John's death, the disciples are still talking about the truth of John the Baptist. The truth will come out. What's in the dark will eventually reach the light. Ched Meyer says it well in his book, Say It to This Mountain, despite this impressive gathering of political, military, and economic leaders, however, it is a young dancing girl and a drunken oaf that finally determine the fate of the Baptist. It's a sardonic caricature of the murderous whims of the powerful. Perhaps what's most disturbing as we hear this story is its own parallel to our own time and place, to our own reality and our own dark days. Barbara Burnow, a retired Lutheran pastor in Minnesota, writes, this week has been an especially difficult one for me. I have watched the world and people around me swing wildly from madness to cruelty and back again. I have struggled and failed to keep from getting caught up in the craziness. As I began to read blogs by my fellow religious professionals this week, I realized I was hoping for something that would help restore my perspective on a healthier setting. These are hard days, these days of dancing women and worrying madness. 
It is hard to find our own truth and to find the courage to speak our own truth in the light of such dizzying news. It is hard to focus and to maintain hope and to carry out the light that indeed there is truth in the midst of things, to sort of dig underneath the sensationalism of the stories in scripture or in the news to get at what's really underneath. It is difficult to know even what our own truth is to speak. A little over a week ago, we lost one of the giants of the contemporary hymn writers of our day. Shirley Arena Murray died on January 25th of 2020. She was a prolific contemporary hymn writer from New Zealand. Her hymns were translated into many languages and were part of more than 140 hymn collections. Murray was born and raised a Methodist, though she married a Presbyterian minister. Professor and hymn writer Colin Gibson, who has set music to some of her songs, described Murray's hymns in 2009 as distinguished by their inclusive language and their innovative use of Maori their bold appropriation of secular terms, and their original poetic imagery drawn from nature and domestic life, but equally by the directness with which they confront contemporary issues. As I consider this week how it is we ought to speak our own truth, Shirley Arena Murray's life and work are a guiding light about how to do it in a way that is both creative and beautiful, and lasting. She was the first woman to be made a fellow of the Hymn Society of the, in the United States and Canada. And she declared that she despaired outdated hymns and songs that are irrelevant to contemporary life and the way we live it. The reason why I began to write hymns, she wrote, is connected to the ethos of being a New Zealander. We have an attitude of do it yourself, a kind of pioneer spirit that is not intimidated by too much tradition and actually welcomes inventiveness. It seems to me that the hymns we sang had no resonance with the world that I live in. There was no imagery that evoked a particular environment, no landscape of thought to accommodate the southern hemisphere. Think of in the bleak midwinter, in high summer, for example. There's no connection with the Maori culture of our society, which is officially bicultural, nothing to articulate our own hopes and visions. So here we see throughout these um, years of Murray's life, throughout the canon of her own works, these hymns that have come down to us, many of which we know well. We'll sing one in our time of prayer today, and we'll sing another in another week or so. We'll sort of pepper some Shirley Arena Murray hymns throughout the next few weeks. Next week, we'll sing A Place at the Table, which Shirley wrote one of the new favorite hymns that we have come to embrace and love, a hymn that ex exemplifies for us her aspirations of inclusive language, her way of setting contemporary issues to music, her way of speaking truth in beautiful ways through music. Then your voice remembers her, Marin Tiribesi writes. If you know because you live, O Christ, the spirit bird of hope is freed for flying, our cages of despair, no longer keep us closed and life-denying. Then someone taught you her song. If you teach in workshop, choir, or campground to touch the earth lightly and nourish the life of the world in our care, then you are part of the greening, the water that blesses the air that is sweet. If you stand at a table with tears running down your cheeks because you were excluded until people learned that for everyone born, everyone, there is a place at the table. Then you hear God's echoing, justice, justice and joy. If your Advent pageant includes not a way in the manger, but a way and in danger, the carol of the refugee children, then at least one small child is reaching out a hand to welcome others to the shores of their land. If you start the singing, after turning off the microphone, love changes life from water to wine for a couple in their 70s trying it again. Silly rehearsals and grumbly guests fade away, and you know what a wedding is. 
if you recognize tunes from deepest needs and symphonies and drums, and you are singing for the music of creation, if you invite Christmas into the here and the now, you are singing no obvious angels. If you learn the word oteria, it's probably paired with alleluia, or turns you upside down. If you, some Lenten morning, ask someone to come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead, or on Pentecost, challenge the community of Christ to look past the church's door, then your voice remembers her, the star woman, who taught us when we were just trying to have a sweet Bethlehem moment to sing about street children, beat children, used children, hurt children, spared children, spoiled children, grown children, lost children, and woke up our hearts. In these dizzying times and in a week where dancing queens have been turned into examples of criticism and protagonists in horror stories, we need to be reminded of where our truths come. We need to be encouraged to speak a relevant word of the sacred in our lives and in our world. We need to be called again to see the images around us as truthful and to see the holy in it, to speak our truths, and to stand up to the Herodias and the Herods of our day. So holy God, you who have called us to be your people, to live in your world and do your will, call us to repentance and restore us to rightful relationship with one another and you for you have made each of us in your image and called us to love one another. This too we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. So our hymn of prayer, which is a Shirley Arena Murray hymn, is in your black hymnal. It's number 297, and it's called Give Thanks. invite you to be seated. It was a hymn that she wrote uh, to honor her grandmother's life and faith. We take a time to share joys and concerns with one another as we gather in worship. Oh, there are so many things and places for us to pray for. Let us um, focus for a moment on the country of China. Let us raise our prayers 
um, and quell our fears to remember the country of China and the people of China in our prayers. I think part of the dizzying news this week that has so upset and disturbed me are the ways that um, the coronavirus that has come out of the city of Wuhan has stirred a perhaps um, never quieted pot of racism. And so the stories that I am hearing from around the world um, of the, the fear and the exclusion that, um, that the fear of contaminant is, is spinning um, are unsettling. So let us find, uh, again, our ground and our center in, in, the, in the compassion and the love that we are called to share. Um, our sister church in Durham, who is one of the churches in our um, association, is installing a new pastor this afternoon. Um, and so our prayers um, for, for the people of uh, Community Church in Durham and uh, the new journey that they will begin with, a newly called pastor, um, this afternoon. I would ask your prayers, of course, for Peg Farwell, who Norm is here. Peg is home. Peg's doing pretty well after surgery last week. Um, and um, just, you know, the challenge of sort of staying still and letting your body recover, um, which is a particular challenge for Peg. Um, and so it's good to have Norm with us. Um, and, and we give thanks for that. Um, I also would ask for prayers for the Fitch family. Um, Lexi uh, has been having seizures this weekend, um, and they are awaiting some follow-up appointments at Dartmouth-Hitchcock tomorrow. Um, and so a tender time of, um, of unknowing um, and, and lots um, of, of fear. So our prayers for all of them. Other prayer concerns to share with one another this morning. Peg. Okay, so prayers for a friend, Carol Carilli, who is headed in for more testing that hopefully will ensure a procedure that is scheduled for Friday. David. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. The ending of all political calls. Woohoo! Uh, I took a page out of Krista's book. I unplugged my phone uh, at home. So if you need me, call my cell phone. <laughs> um, yes, a prayer indeed. Beth. Okay, so prayers for good friends of the Rourke's, who are friends from college, for the Andersons, um, who were both diagnosed with cancer on the same day, um, one with breast cancer and one with colon cancer. So breast cancer surgery has happened and went well, and reconstruction is pending, but, um, but prayers for the, for the colon cancer. Yeah. Yeah, Fred. Yes, uh, it is lovely to have the, the Fernalds back up on both feet um, and with us. And so prayers of thanksgiving from Fred for, for our prayers and for flowers that we sent. And um, good to have you with, back. Katie. It's Beth Burke's birthday today. So she left that out of her prayers. So thanks, Katie. Um, yeah, Betty. Oh, prayers for a friend of the Coolidge's grandson, Eli, who's 13 and had a terrible accident and has gone home, so is doing pretty well. Great, wonderful, joy. All right, let us have some time of silent prayer. Steadfast and holy God, we give you thanks for dancing women. We give you thanks for the ways that they delight and inspire us, the ways that they invite us to dance alongside them and to rejoice, to celebrate life, 
and to find our own unique and beautiful patterns that we each dance. Holy God, forgive us when we ask too much or when we allow too much, when unreasonable things are asked of us and we say yes because we are afraid or we are unsure. Forgive us when we don't answer the phone, when we do not say no, when we keep quiet, when we forget the reason that we have been put on this beautiful planet. Help us to become better versions of ourselves, who delight in the ways that you have beautifully made us each uniquely and different. Give us courage to speak our truths and to receive the truth of one another. Trouble us with your scriptures and send us packing with suitcases that are nearly empty to receive the world. For those things we have named in prayer today and for those many things that we have left unsaid, we know that you hear them completely before a word is on our lips. So delight with us on a sunny February morning and carry us into this week and all of the crazy madness that it may ask of us. Keep us centered and quiet and joyful, committed to touching the earth lightly. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. We are invited to find our place at the table when we come to this space together. We are invited to give thanks for the beautiful lives that have come before us and the ones that are around us and the ones that will follow. We are invited to be the people of God in this place. May our morning offering be received.
join me in our prayer of dedication. Lord, let our congregation be a witness to you, immersed in scripture, constant in prayer, joyful in worship, generous in giving, a loving, supportive community, reaching out to those in need. Accept these gifts we offer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Our closing hymn is number 52 in your black hymnal, but it's also an insert in your bulletin. There is a name I love to hear. friends, as you go out into this week, speak your truth. Speak it in the ballot box and speak it in the square and speak it around the kitchen table and speak it everywhere. For we are the children of God and we have been diversely and beautifully made in God's image. May we carry that love and that beauty into all the world. Amen.